All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do a study today. I know it's been long ever since I did a study, but we're back into the father's business and we need to continue doing these studies out there, right? So today's topic, as you can see from the title, is the truth as it is in Jesus. Uh, and we're going to talk about the faith of Jesus, right? So first of all, we're going to orient ourselves to the truth as it is in Jesus, how God views the truth, right? Because we are now living in a world where everyone else claims to have truth. It's about my truth, um, and my truth is the only thing that is uh, mattering at this point, right? Uh, everybody else, whether you're in a religious circle, you're an individual, you're an intellectual, everyone else is claiming to have truth, right? So people are going to say, we have the truth. And this one is going to say, I have the truth. And oh, everybody else claims to have the truth. But in reality, what really matters, and this is what we need to talk about, the ultimate discovery of what really matters uh, when it comes to God. How does God view truth, right? So we're talking about the title, The Truth As It Is In Jesus. Uh, yesterday, I did this study with a group of people, uh, and it was it was engaging. And I thought, well, let's do it online as well so that we have uh, a record in place of such a study. right? So I'm going to do this study today. Then I'm going to do a, a part two. This is part one of the study. So we're going to do a part two, a follow-up to this study as well. So I ask that you ask God to teach you, right? Because I'm only here to give you the word of God, right? And I'm going to start with a caution. And this caution goes to you, the listener, okay? You, the person who is listening. And it goes to another person that will stand to talk about God. Whether you are a pastor or you call yourself a pastor, a bishop, you call yourself all these title words, right? When you when you when you stand on a platform to speak, or when you take on the aspect of speaking about God, what is the caution that you need to have? And I'm gonna I'm gonna start with a caution that goes out to anybody that listens and also anybody that decides to speak on the things of God, right? And it's coming from First Peter chapter four, this eleven. I'm gonna read that verse and then throw out a caution to you guys out there and then Let's see where it goes. The truth as it is in Jesus, the faith of Jesus is the title of our study. But let's start with a caution. Anyone that stands on a platform to speak about God, what is their orientation? What is it that they need to have? And you as a listener, what is it that you need to pay attention to, right? In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, the Bible has this to say, If any man speaks... Let him speak as the oracle of God. If any man minister or preaches, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. Not the ability that you've given yourself. The ability which God giveth. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So that's a caution that I'm throwing out there. If I'm going to speak today and I'm going to speak about God, I'm going to speak about Jesus, I need to speak as the oracle of God or I shouldn't speak at all. It's either I'm speaking as an oracle of God or I'm speaking as an oracle of the devil. And it's either God is going to speak through me and to me or he doesn't at all, right? And this is a caution that I'm throwing out there. There are a lot of people that have these ministries, there are a lot of people that preach, a lot of people that sing, a lot of people that do service to God, right, uh, in the name of service, and then they end up getting that glory, and the glory doesn't go back to God. And Peter here in First Peter chapter 4, verse 11, is basically giving us a caution. He says, if I am going to speak, I need to speak as an oracle of God, so that, what? So that all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise." And dominion forever and ever. Praise doesn't go to a man. Praise goes back to God, right? So that's that's the first question that I'm going to start with. So let's go into our study for today. We're going to go through a study. And I'm going to give you a lot of Bible verses. Because I want to speak as an oracle of God. I want to speak as the sayings of God. I don't want to speak as my own saying, right? So we're going to start from Ephesians chapter 4. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21. And Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21 basically says, If so be that ye or you have heard him, and this is Jesus, if so be that you have heard him and you have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. There is where, this is where our title is coming from. As the truth is in Jesus. There is a particular truth that God is interested. And as we go through the study, you begin to see the objective reality of how God views reality. He uses the truth and the truth as it is in Jesus. Outside of Jesus, there is no truth at all. There is no truth that is substantial to God. So God's orientation or God's lenses of viewing reality is the truth as it is in Jesus. So we must always keep this verse in mind, right? It's in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21. Always keep this verse in mind. Truth, all truth is only true. Truth and all truth is only true as it is revealed in Jesus. He says this of himself, and, and you read this from John chapter 20, John, John chapter 14, verse 6. This is what Jesus says. He says, I am the way, I am the truth and the life. Right? So he says this of himself. He is the truth. This truth does not come by intellect. And I know we have a lot of intellectuals, people that have studies, they have PhD, they have all these other stuff, right? This truth that he says he is, it doesn't come by intellect because the freshly brain cells, our minds cannot abhor or cannot behold the invisible things of God, right? Because it comes only, how does this truth come about? How do you begin to understand how it is the truth, the objective truth that God views everything in? It comes only by the spirit of wisdom and by the revelation of the knowledge of him. And you read this from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. That's how this truth comes. We have a lot of people that are on the intellectual peak of the world. People that are revered by so many men, respected and honored, honored researchers, people that have gone deep and they have got vouchers eyes to, to penetrate through everything else and all this, but they cannot penetrate the truth of Jesus. Why? Because it doesn't come with our intellect. It doesn't come with that, right? They are, sharp in, they are sharp instruments, but they're not sharp instruments for God, right? So this truth only comes by one mode. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, it tells us it comes by the spirit of wisdom and by revelation of the knowledge of him. And that is how God gives this truth, right? And as we talk about the first part of the study is going to be about the truth as it is in Jesus, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see how we can segue it and start talking about the faith of Jesus. This is going to be all part one. Then we'll do part two, I think, in a few days' time, right? So let's go to the Bible, right? There's so many people that inquire into the truth. Now, like I said in the, in the beginning of our study for today, is that a lot of people have this subjectivity to truth, right? Like, this is my truth. This is what I believe. This is, this is, this is how I see things. And we're living in that world where everybody else claims to have the truth. This is the truth for me. And this is my truth, right? And as if, as if God uses you as an orientation of how he views reality. He doesn't. The Bible clearly says God uses Jesus as the lens of what is true and what is not true. And we're going to see this as, as the study goes on. So in John 18, there's a man that asked Jesus about truth. In John 18, uh, there's 30, 37. We're going to read John 18, the 37 and 38. Listen to what the Bible has to say. It says, Pilate therefore said unto him, this is when Jesus was before Pilate's bar. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? He's asking this question. Are you a king then? Then Jesus answered and says, Thou art said that I am king. You're the one that said that I'm king. To this end I was born. And for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. So Jesus says, to this end, I came into this world. I came to this end that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Everyone that is a true seeker of truth will hear the voice of Jesus. This is what Jesus says. Verse 38, listen to us. And then Pilate said unto him, what is truth? And then, when he had said this, 
he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. So Pilate is asking the question, what is truth, right? And there's a song, and Zicalo is here and is watching. Uh, there's that song which says, uh, uh, truth was standing right in front of him. But he's asking, what is truth? And then he turns without really getting the answer. And then he turns to the Jews and then he says something very profound. He says, I find no fault in him at all. And that is what truth is. Truth was standing right in front of this man that asked, what is truth then? And Jesus says, I am the truth. And then without even getting the answer, this guy turns and then he says, I don't find any fault in him. So if you examine truth, you're not going to find any fault in it. And it is amazing that this guy receives this revelation and then he says, I find no fault in him. That is the nature of truth and that is the nature of Jesus. So in 1 John, I'm going to read another verse. In 1 John chapter, chapter 5, verse 20, listen to what the Bible says. And when, and when we know that the Son of God is come, the Son of God is come and has given unto us an understanding that we may know him, that we may know him that is true. That we may know him that is true and that we are in him that that is true even to the son who is jesus christ this is the true god and eternal god so jesus here has been described as the true god there is no god apart from him and is the eternal and is eternal life so if you do not have him you do not have eternal life Right. So I'm going to go ahead now and give you uh, the mind, the two minds. And there are always two groups in this world. There are always two groups. Even when you go back to Genesis, you're going to, you're going to discover the two groups. And the two groups are those that are going to reflect who God is and those that are going to reflect who the devil really is. Right. So the two minds that exist, we're going to see the mind of God, which is revealed in the scriptures and also the mind of Satan which is revealed in the scriptures as well. I hope you're paying attention. So let's look at the mind of God, how God views things. We're talking about God's orientation of reality. In Colossians, and I'm going to read Colossians chapter 1, the 16 and 17. Here's the verse. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. It says, For it was in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, things that are visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created and exist through him. That is by his activity and for him. Now, begin. I want you to begin to munch through these verses because it begins to tell you the mind of God and why he created things the way they are, whether they be visible or invisible. Listen to what he says. For I'll go back and read 16. It says, for it was in him that all things were created. The template of creation is Jesus. Everything orients itself, whether in heaven or things on earth, visible or invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, whether rulers or powers, whether all things that were created exist only through him. That is by his activity and for him. So nobody exists for themselves. I don't exist for myself. I exist for him. And through him, by him, for him, everything is like Paul Washer said, everything, when Jesus Christ finally comes, he's going to say, mine, 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 mine. Nothing belongs to us, right? In verse 17, it says, it says, he existed, he existed and is before all things. Meaning that before all things, before things came into existence, Jesus existed. Meaning that he's got life in him, original unborrowed, underived. He existed before all things. And in him, all things hold together. All, all, things con, all things consist in him or they hold together in him. He is the controlling, cohesive force of the universe. That is who he is. And that is how we need to look at him. So that is how God Orients, orients himself to reality. This is how God views reality. He views reality through the lenses of his son, who he is. Everything, everything. And that's what the Bible clearly says, that everyone's knee shall finally bow to him. Everyone shall bow to him, right? 
And that is Jesus. And that's how God orient. That's his mind. That's how God sees things. Everything finds their orientation in his son. Right? But what's the other mind? That's the mind of God. That's how God views reality. What's the other mind? And when you begin to see the mind of the devil or the mind of Satan or the mind of Lucifer, you begin to see how humanity has been infected by his mind and we think like the devil. We behave like the devil. Our cognition functions like him. You'll be so surprised how akin we are to him, how similar we are to the devil. And if you're not scared to face the truth about who you are, then transformation can begin to happen. It's only those people that don't want to hear. They close their ears, just like the Pharisees, when, when, when the truth was being spoken to them by Stephen. They closed their ears and, and notched their, 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 their teeth and ended up gripping and getting stones and stoning that man that was telling them the truth, right? Listen, let's look at the mind of Lucifer. What was different? What was his orientation of reality? He chose, this is what the devil chose, and we read it from the scriptures. He chose to look to himself, and he chose not to abide in God. He chose not to orient himself to how God sees things, how God views things. He chose to look to where? To himself. And what a world we live in where everything is about self. It's about me. It's about my truth is about my reality. It's about my feelings, how I feel, not how the Holy Spirit leads me, but how I feel matters more than how God sees things, right? So Lucifer chose to orient himself and to be the center of how things happen, right? Let's look at this from Ezekiel, and we're going to read these verses just to cement this thought. In Ezekiel chapter 20. 28 verse 17, and then we read 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 6. Listen to what it says. It says, thine heart, your heart, your heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Hello, beautiful people. Here is what happened to the devil. And here is how Lucifer, the light bearer, turned into the devil. It says, your heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, and you are corrupted, and you and thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Two things. Before I move on, two things. One, his heart was lifted up in pride because of the beauty that he had. Remember, he was the sum total of all the angels. There's no angel. All, all the angels were created. He was like the pattern of creation of all the angels. So when it comes to beauty and everything else, he was given everything else. If you read Ezekiel chapter 20, 20, 28 itself, verse 17, or and the other verses that surround it, you're going to discover that he was this gorgeous, beautiful creature that God created. He had every covering stone. Right now, we have people that wear jewelry. They put jewelry on themselves and all that. Try to look good. But Lucifer was way, 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 way above that. He was decorated with all this beauty. He says, thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. And you have corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Your brightness, not the brightness of God. You chose your, your splendor, your glory, your orientation, right? And then God says this about him. This is what he's going to do. He says, I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings and they shall behold thee. They're going to see you for who you are. That you are nothing but just a scanderer and the one that has terrorized nations. And, and, and the Bible actually says that people are going to wonder, is this the one? Is this the one that has terrorized nations? And this is what God is going to do, right? In 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, listen to what the Bible says. It says, he, he, he must not be a new convent or he may develop a crowded and stupid state of mind as the result of pride and be blinded by conceit and fall, listen, this is the warning, the, the warning is that you will fall, fall into the condemnation that the devil once did. It's like you're going to, like David usually says, my mentor usually says, like it's a Lucifer 2.0 and there's a whole study that I'm trying to develop around the concept of Lucifer 2.0. Don't fall like him. So you fall into the condemnation that the devil once did. You can warp your mind and twist your mind and become uh, another rebellion of Lucifer. 
because of thy beauty, because of thy splendor, because you've oriented yourself to look at reality through you and you've negated to abide in Jesus. And you see, as the study goes, in John chapter 8, I'm reading another verse. In John chapter 8, verse 44, it says, it says, you are of your father, the devil. This is Jesus speaking. If you don't want to listen to me, at least listen to Jesus. It says, you are of your father, the devil, and it is you who will practice the last and the gratification of that, that are characteristic of your father, the devil. So listen, there are two households. There's the house of God, and then there's a the household of the devil. And this God and, and the devil are fathers of households, right? And they have got children, right? They have children. So we're not all children of God. Do not lie to yourself or do not hear a lie that says everybody else is a child of God. That's a lie from hell. Not everyone is a child of God. And Jesus here speaks and says, you are of your father the devil. And guess who he was speaking to? He's speaking to the Pharisees. He's speaking to people that understand the Bible. He's speaking to people that have, have mastered the Bible. He says, you are of your father the devil. And you're going to do exactly what he, your father, has, has been designed to do. And he goes on and says he was a murderer from the beginning. And then he did not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a falsehood or a lie, he speaks what is natural to him. And he is a liar himself and the father of lies and all that is false in the world. That is who's, who the father is. That is the household of the devil, right? He says he did not stand in the truth. He chose to orient himself by looking at himself. And that is how the mystery of iniquity was developed. In Jude, listen to what Jude says. In Jude chapter 1, uh, Jude only has one, one chapter. And that's chapter 1. Uh, we're going to read verse 6. It says, the angels, and I wanted to link it with the verse that we just read, that he did not stand in the truth. Right? The devil did not stand in the truth. He left the position that he was supposed to uh, occupy. In Jude chapter 1, listen, it says, The angels that did not keep their first estate, their first estate was to stand in the truth. They left their first estate, their first position, and desired to be far much more than what they were, right? And left their own habitation, and he has reserved an eternal, and are reserved in it everlasting chains, under darkness, unto the judgment of the, of the great day. So Jude is telling us this. He's telling us that the angel left their first estate, their first habitation. They did not stand in the truth. They did not abide in Jesus. Their orientation changed. We're going to be the pattern. We're going to be how we look at things. We're not going to pay attention to what God says. My life, my way, and my way only. So they went and veered off the path of truth. And truth's orientation is Jesus. God's orientation, and we read the verses earlier in Colossians, God's orientation of viewing things is that everything was created to abode in Jesus. But they chose to be their own persons. And this is how the mystery of iniquity was developed. The twistedness, the warping of their soul was developed. The mind of Satan, that mind which looks away from God to itself, and seeks to live independent of the creator. Come on, is this not my generation? You tell me, you tell me, like you examine you. As you're listening to me, I want you to examine you. How many times have you chose to live independent of the creator? That is the mindset of the devil, to live independent from God, to do my own things, right? To have my way and my way only, and not God's way, right? That same mind, it is that same mind that corrupted our first parents. And since then, we all like sheep have turned everyone to his own way. And you read this from the Bible. The Bible clearly says we all like sheep have turned everyone to his own way. Everyone is in there doing their own stuff, living independent from God. And we wonder why we have so much sadness, so much, so much sorrow in us, right? And you read that from uh, the book of Isaiah. Isaiah basically tells us that in Isaiah 53, verse 6, it tells us that we, everyone has turned to his own way. We're all like sheep wandering and doing our own stuff, right? But I'm going to read from the book of Ephesians now. Ephesians chapter 18, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, sorry. It says, 
their moral understanding, their moral understanding is darkened and their reason is what crowded. They are alienated and that word alienated means to be estranged or self-banished from the life of God. Is it that God is hiding from us and he doesn't want to, us to abide in the truth? No, we have self-banished. Self-banished. We banished ourselves from the life of God by our own decision. We have allowed darkness to cloud our mind from the life of God and have no share in it because of the ignorance, the want of knowledge or perception or the willful blindness. We are willingly, willfully, we choose to be blind. And remember that verse, the famous verse that people usually quote from the scriptures, which says that my people perish because of what? <laughs> because of lack of knowledge. The verse goes on to say it's because they have rejected knowledge. Hence they perish. It says I, because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you. And the true understanding of the spiritual knowledge that we need to have about ourselves and about life comes from Jesus. It says you have self-banished. You have rejected knowledge. You haven't spent time with Jesus. You do not have a relationship with Jesus. You might know about him, but really having that relationship, you do not have. So you self-banished by your decisions. That's willful. The will, the power of decision, the power of choice. You choose not to orient yourself to me. And that is a deep, that is deep seated in them due to their hardness of heart. You have a hard you choose not to feel towards me. You choose not to be sensitive towards me. You choose to be callous towards me. And it is their insensitivity to their moral nature that is causing this willful blindness. So, because we find ourselves trapped in this mindset of Lucifer, the mindset of the devil, the mindset that orients itself, everything has to be about me and all that. Da, 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 da. Everything has to be about my self-esteem. Everything has to be about this self, 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 self. And we forget that self is our number one enemy because self is the only thing that will stand in our way of getting into heaven. We are going to stand in our way. I am the only obstacle into getting into heaven, not even the devil. I am the only obstacle. I am the one that loves the things of the devil. I am the one that enjoys the things of the devil, not even the devil, right? So self, because we have trapped ourselves into this mindset where we want to live our lives apart from the life of God, independent of him. What is God going to do? What's God's move? God's move has always been one move. God only has one move to make, and that's it. And that is redemption in Christ. His orientation how he views reality is that I'm going to orient them back into Christ. And the next verses that we're going to read are going to, to show us how he does that, right? In Ephesians chapter 1, verse, verse 10. Listen to what the Bible says. It seems like we're going to spend a lot of time in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, this is God's orientation of reality. It says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, the maturity of time, he might gather, and this this. This verse, like I will say, this verse doesn't make sense grammatically speaking. It says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. That statement doesn't make sense if you're writing English, that is. That he might gather together in one all things in Christ. In the fullness of time, in the maturity of time. When, when the end time finally reaches, like this is it, God's plan is to gather everything together in one. The only one through which he builds reality and that is in Jesus. All things in Christ, both which are in heaven, everything that is in heaven will be gathered in one. Do you understand that the act of Jesus, the event of Jesus, the death of Jesus, him coming to live a life that was holy and pure has affected even everything that is in heaven. The angels are kept from rebellion because of his death on the cross. And that is how powerful that event is. That is why it is the one event that even God cannot, cannot, God cannot replicate again. It cannot be done again. It was done once and that's it. It's an eternal act of God. That's his final move. Redemption in Christ. Listen, that he may gather together all things in one in Christ, both things that are in heaven and those that are on earth, even in him. Again, he emphasizes even in 
him. Now, when we talk about in him, through him, via him, we're talking about him. Okay, we're not talking. We're not talking about anything else. That oh, just, 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 just uh, little, little segments about him. We're talking about God's orientation of reality is Jesus. Okay. In Colossians, Colossians chapter one, verse ten. Listen to what the Bible says. Verse twenty. It says, "And having made peace." Listen now. Having made peace, this is the Bible, listen, it says, Having made peace through the blood of his cross, that event, that one-time event, that one act of God that can never be repeated, right? Having made peace through the blood of the cross, by him to reconcile how many things? All things unto himself. God has already made peace. God is not calling upon you to make peace with him. He says, I have already made peace. 2,000 years ago, I made peace already. And that peace, I want you to believe in that being who is your peace, who is your, your Solomon. Right? You are the Shulamite, he's your Solomon. He's your peace, your rest, your canopy. He's your husband, the one that gives you rest. The one you can rest in and say, I have rest in this one, this one being. It says, having made peace, through the blood of, of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto him. By him, I say, whether they be things in heaven or on earth, everything else, peace, it is through Jesus. So my friend, this is the only way God is going to achieve perfection. Perfection is not, oh, he's going to perfect me and I'm going to become all this holy, sanctimonious being and all that. No, no, no. Perfection is through that one person that God has made peace with and that is Jesus, the perfect one, right? So we've been called to go through something that is also perfect. He's perfect. We need to be perfect in our sphere. In our sphere, what is the perfectness that God requires from us? And I'm going to read some of the things that that, 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 that are around perfectness. And you see that God, when he's demanding for perfection from us, he's not demanding something that is impossible. One, the perfection of brokenness. We can be perfectly broken as human beings. Contrived. Remorseful. The perfection of repentance. We can have perfect repentance that does not need to be repented of. The carefulness of our, of our change. What carefulness that is going to rot in us. The perfection of faith in the faith of Jesus. We can perfectly look to the, perf to the faith of Jesus. Our, our, our faith is a hand that lays hold of his faith. And we're going to talk about the faith of Jesus as we go. So we can be perfectly be nothing and him everything. I can perfectly be nothing. I can say, you know what? I am nothing. He is everything to me. That is the perfection that God requires. Perfectly confess that I am nothing and he is everything. It's only those people that understand the nothingness of who they are that see the everythingness of Jesus. If you think you're something, I'm all this and you, you got all this this frenzy, demonic activity going on in your head of Lucifer's pride eating you up from within. And you think, oh, you know, I'm this and all that. God says, you must see yourself as nothing and see me as everything, right? God likes brokenness, right? He likes brokenness because brokenness gives him the natural impulse to recreate that which is broken. He is the creator, right? That is why it says he's close to the broken in heart right? Perfectly be nothing. So I'm going to go ahead now and read John 17. John 17, verse 21. This is the prayer of Jesus. We talk about the prayer of Jesus in the Bible. We talk about uh, the Lord's Prayer and all that. That is a template of prayer, but the actual Lord's Prayer is in John 17. John 17, I'm going to read 21 and 22. Let's see where we go from there. Okay, let's see this, this perfect, perfect Reality that God wants to create in John 17. In John 17, and I'm going to read, um, I didn't tilt my timer. Well, okay. It's okay. I can tilt it now. Let's see if we can tilt the timer now. In John 17, um, there's 21, it says that they all may be one. This is Jesus, guys. And he's praying to the Father. His prayer is that they all may be one. 
the, as thou father and art in me, I in thee, that they also may be one in us. The perfection is that Jesus is saying, listen, that they all may be one and the world may believe that you have sent me. It is that oneness that we find in Christ that is going to be a testimony to the world that he has been sent. Verse 22, it says, and the glory isn't, and this is the verse that usually brings me to tears. It says, the glory which thou has given me, I have given them. Do you know that in the Bible, God says, I share my glory with no man? And God brings us to this honor at this point, right? At this point, he brings us to this honor where he says, the glory that you've given me, the character that you've given me, Lord, I have given them as a gift. So when it is being given, when God has given and I have not received, the problem is not with God, the problem is with me. The problem is always with me and not with God. God says the glory that you have given me, I have given them. And there's an actual verse in the Bible that says God does not share his glory with anyone. But at this point, God is saying, I am sharing into my glory. Who are we that God will see us like that, that I want you to share into my glory? That they may be one, even as we are one. John 17, verse 23, it says, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. This is the perfection. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and I have loved them and they have loved me. Right? So this is how we obtain the victory. This is how we're going to obtain the victory over trusting in and looking to our internal resources. Because we are into the world now. Even the church has, bought, has, has beaten into this, this, this lie. Right? Like the, the, the human potential movement that is in the church now. We see all these motivational speakers that are standing on platforms and talking about human potential and all this. It's the devil's it's the devil's it's the devil's lie in trying to make us think we are something when we are nothing and our only true potential and I'll say this our only true potential as human beings is in our nothingness. It's when I see myself as nothing that God can make me something, can make something out of me. But when you think you have something and there's something intrinsically powerful in you as the motivational speakers speak and all these old, they are preachers, by the way, they are preaching, they are on gospel. The true gospel of God is that Adam has failed, everybody else has failed, but Jesus has come and has triumphed. And we are nothing is everything. And when you look to his everythingness, then he can make something out of you. That is the true gospel, right? And, and when you start embracing the true gospel, there's an attack on the true gospel. There's a, literally an assault on the tower on the true gospel. And there are few preachers that will preach the true gospel, the gospel that brings us to our knees and see the everythingness of Jesus and our nothingness, like Everything is the true gospel that makes us to humble ourselves and not have this Lucifer mentality of looking into the internal resources that we have, right? So even the resources that the Holy Spirit is going to give you, the, the Holy Spirit is going to empower you and give you these internal resources for us not to look to them as the ultimate thing, but to look to Jesus and him as the ultimate thing. The only way we're going to get the victory is by holding on to the faith, by faith holding on to that victory which has already been accomplished for us without us in Jesus. That's the only way. The only way I'm going to fight the internal, internal struggle of wanting to rely on my internal resources, even what the Holy Spirit is working in me, because even the, the Holy Spirit's work, even the Holy Spirit's work in my life, even that needs the moist blood of Jesus. That needs the moist blood of Jesus. Even the work of our Holy Spirit needs the moist blood of Jesus. Why? Because we are not perfect beings. 
because we are tainted, we are corrupted. Even the, the highest service that we can offer to God, the highest service that I can offer, say this is the highest service I can offer to God, that is tainted with pride. We are leprosy. We have leprosy, the leprosy of sin. If you see a leper, right? If you see a leper, those that have seen lepers before, uh, in Eastern Province, there's a place called Mami Border, and there's Mami Church there, uh, where they keep lepers. If you see a leper, a leper can wear nice clothes now, and in a few seconds, they're tainted with blood. That is our nature. The nice things that we do, the good things, the praises, the worships, the, the, that come from us, all these beautiful services that we offer to God, they need the moist blood of Jesus, the only one without the leprosy of sin. The only one without the leprosy of sin. Even our services, that is why Paul says, there's no boasting. I want to be found in his righteousness, not my righteousness, not my own works. And that is the trumpet that we need to sound. Because we are living in a world where everybody else wants to be deified. I'm a God in my own place. I'm the greatest that has ever existed of all time. Everybody else wants to take the place of God. It's Lucifer 2.0. It's Lucifer 2.0. And I, I I'll repeat that. It's Lucifer 2.0. Especially those that are, know the truth, right? So the Holy Spirit only comes to make effectual that which has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. It only makes effectual. Makes it effective. It's an activating agency. He is an activating agency. Okay. Now, having said that, having said that, having made all that rant, I'm trying to look at the time. We still have time. We can now segue it and begin to talk about the faith of Jesus, right? The faith of Jesus. What is the faith of Jesus? I'm not going to read the quotations that I read yesterday to the guys, but I'm going to dive straight into the Bible. I want us to explore the faith of Jesus by which we're justified before God because that's the only thing that matters. God's orientation, how God views things, how I view things, it doesn't matter. How does he view things, right? So the Old Testament prophecies, if you read the Bible of the Old Testament, you're going to discover that it shows us that Jesus would trust in and be kept by the faith in his father, that Jesus was going to have faith in his father right and that's the faith of jesus and we need to explore what that looks like how god speaks of him having faith in him right and god is speaking in the old testament he's speaking about the son listen to what he says we start from the book of isaiah i hope you have your bibles and you're writing these verses down all i'm doing is to speak as the oracle of god just to give you god's word right um in isaiah 42 we're going to read verse 1 and 6, then we read Isaiah 49, verse 5 and 8, when we continue reading these verses and spending time meditating on them. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 42, verse 1 and verse 6. It says, Behold my servant. This is God the Father calling Jesus my servant, the ultimate servant, my, my, the one who's going to carry out my will. Right? Behold my servant whom I uphold. Jesus was going to be upheld by the Father. He's going to be kept by the Father. Whom I uphold, mine elect. When we talk about election, we're talking about one person who is the elect of God. It says, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. God does not delight in us. He delights in the, in the Son. Remember when Jesus came from the waters, when he was baptized, right? When he came from the waters and when he was baptized, there's a voice that came from heaven and says, this is my Son in whom I am what well pleased, I delight. In whom my soul delights. I have kept my, I have, I have put my spirit upon him. That is why he was anointed as the Mashiach, as the Christ, right? The one who has the bubbling foundation, fountain of life. The one who is the source of all life. Behold, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Verse 6, it says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. We're looking at the faith of Jesus. It says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and I will uphold thine hand and keep thee, and I will give thee for a covenant of the people. The covenant of the people to be a light to the Gentiles. So Jesus is going to be kept by the Father. He will be preserved by the Father, and then he will be given as a covenant. 
Our covenant is a person, and that is Jesus. Are you with me? That is Jesus. Yeshua is his name. He shall be given to a people as a what? As a covenant. Our covenant, we've not, we've not been called upon to, 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 to make a covenant with God. God has, has given us a person who is a covenant, and that is Jesus. In Isaiah 49, verse 5, listen to what it says. In Isaiah 49, it's going to be a light to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are looking for light. The unbelievers are looking for light. They are looking for something that they need to orient themselves into. They are looking for a light that comes and shines, and he is going to be that light. We are not their light. He is the light, right? In uh, um, Isaiah... Isaiah 49, verse 5 and 8. Listen to what it says in verse 5. And now that saith the Lord that has formed me from the womb to be his servant. From the womb, from the womb, Jesus was ordained to be the servant of God. And he was formed that way. It says, I, it says, uh, to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Here it mentions Jacob. When it talks about Jacob, it's talking about the deceitful part of, of who we are. We are going to be brought back to him because we've gone our way. We've veered off the path. We've become deceitful. We, have, we are the heel catchers. We are, we are like the serpent that, that beats the heel of Jesus. We have his mentality, right? Listen to what it says. Where the hill catches, the hill catches the devil's mentality. And this is Jacob. He says he's a hill catcher, the deceiver. And through it, though Israel be not gathered, yet I will be glorious in the eyes of the Lord. Jesus is going to be glorious in the eyes of the Lord. And he says, my God shall be my strength. Who's going to be God? Who's going to be Jesus' strength? What is his faith? What is his strength? Where does he get his courage? Where does he get his esteem? It's coming from the strength of the Father. Verse 8 and says, That saith the Lord, in an acceptable time, I have heard thee. And in the day of salvation, I have helped thee. And I will preserve thee. And I will give thee for a covenant of the people. Again, as I keep repeating this. Right? As I seize the light, and he says, I will give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth. The earth is only going to be established anew, afresh, through Jesus Christ, who is the foundation of the earth. And to cause to inhabit the desolate, desolated, uh, 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 desolated heritages. And, and we are the heritages that have been desolate. We have committed the abomination of desolation. We have aligned ourselves with the first act deceiver and Jesus needs to come and God says he's going to cause him to inherit the desolated heritages. Nazar 50, again, we're looking at the faith of Jesus. This was the faith of Jesus. This was his faith, his confidence, right? In Nazar 50, the 7 and 9, it says, For the Lord will help me. For the Lord will help who? Me. Therefore, I shall not be confounded. Therefore, I have to I've set, my, I've set my face as a flint. And I know that I will not be ashamed. This is Jesus. He sets his face as a flint. He's going to Jerusalem. His confidence as he's marching on, living his life on earth. His confidence is this. I know that the Lord will help me. And I will not be confounded. I've set my face as a flint. I will do his will. Right? His will is for me to die for these people. And verse 9, it says, Behold, the Lord will help me. Again, that's his confidence. That's his faith. He looks to God. The Lord will help me. In no way does Jesus say, I'm going to help myself. I'm going to be this bad person and this muscle-driven person. He doesn't say any of that. He decides to say, the Lord will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lord, they will wax old as a garment, and the moth shall eat them up. So Jesus admonished his followers to trust in the name of the Lord. Why? Because he did exactly that. Remember when he's talking to them about the mansions in heaven? What does he say? He says, you believe in me, believe in the Father. You believe in the Father, believe in me also. For in my Father's house are many mansions. He says, you believe in God, because I believe in God. Right? Um, in Isaiah 50, there's 10, and we read 10 and 11. Isaiah 50, there's 10 and 11 says, Who among you is he that feareth the Lord, 
that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and does no light. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. This was his trust. This was his, conf his confidence. Verse 11, it says, Listen now, ye that kindle a fire. This is a warning. This is a warning that is going out there to those that have their own fires. He says, listen now, you that kindle a fire, that encompass yourself about with sparks, that walk in the light of your fire, not God's fire, your own fire, your own strange fire. In the sparks that ye have kindled, this shall be, this you shall receive of my hand. You shall lie down in sorrow. The kindling of our own, sparkling, the sparklings of our own kindling. It's my own fire. I'm being driven by my fire. It's about you. It's not the fire of God, right? It's, you're not receiving the fire of God. Even in, uh, in the Old Testament, when the Day of Atonement was constituted, it was based on the principle that they had brought in strange fire. Strange fire. We, as human beings, emit strange fire. These are the sparks of our own kindlings. And God says, I don't want that fire. There's only one fire that I accept, and it's a fire of Jesus. He says, I did not, and you need to draw the distinctions, because the day of atonement is a day of distinction. There is God, and there is you, he's a creature. And creatures need to rely upon the creator, right? The ultimate creator, right? So the keynote of Jesus' life is found in the book of Hebrews. This was the keynote of his life. Listen now, this was a key note of his life. Jesus' key note of his life is found in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, and I'm going to read verse 13 in the Amplified Bible. Listen to what he says. And again he says, My trust, my assured alliance, reliance, and confident hope shall be fixed in him. That's Jesus. You see, we're dealing with a person that could rely on himself. That could be so self-assured. That could be so self-assated. But he chooses, listen to what it says, My trust and assured reliance and confident hope shall be fixed in him. And again I say, I am here and I the children of and I am the children of whom you have given me. So everybody else who God has given to Jesus, their alliance, reliance, their assured trust and confident hope will be fixed in God. This was the keynote of his life. I trust the Father. I trust the Father. And this was the strength of his experience. Now I'm going to read from uh, Desire of Ages. Desire of Ages, page 119. Listen to what it says. Beautifully, he puts it there. Jesus, and this is a story that you know. Jesus is being tempted by the devil. He's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And he's in the wilderness and being tempted by the devil. And this is the commentary that comes. He says, if Christ's confidence in God could be shaken, if his confidence in God could be shaken, Satan knew that the, vic that the victory in the whole controversy would be his. So, if the devil could just shake, just shake Jesus' confidence in God, the devil knew the victory is mine. I've won the great controversy. I've won the great controversy. The great controversy. He, could, he could overcome Jesus. He hoped that under the force of despondency and extreme hunger, Christ would lose faith in his father and work a miracle in his own behalf. Had he done this, the plan of salvation would have been broken. Everything was at stake when Jesus Christ was being tempted. The plan of salvation, redemption, him, God gathering us back in Christ would have been broken. Okay. The devil wanted, wanted Jesus to lose faith in his father. And this was the faith of Jesus. The faith of the son, the faith of Jesus, him holding in and fighting and gaining victory over that battle. That was the first instant of the battle. And in Gethsemane, we see him fighting again. Right? The faith of the son was the faith of the father. And the faith of the father, the confidence of the father in Jesus is the quintessential faith of all faith. It is the mother of all faith. It swallows in every type of faith, the quintessential faith. The faith 
that the father had in Jesus, the faith of Jesus, the faith of Jesus. That's the one that we're talking about. So in Romans, the quintessential faith, in Romans chapter 3, there's 3, and Psalms uh, 84, the 7, then we read John chapter 1. We're still reading the verses. I hope you're not tired. In Romans chapter 3, there's 3, listen to what it says. For if some did not believe, what if some did not believe? What if some don't believe in Jesus? What if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Paul says, God forbid, let every man be a liar and God be true. If you don't believe, if no man decides to believe in Jesus, if no man on planet Earth decides to believe in Jesus, do you know that humanity, a sample of humanity would be preserved in the Godwood because Jesus took upon our nature? At least there's one being that believed in God, that had faith in God through and through, and that is Jesus in his human flesh. Functioning as a human, there's one being who is a sample in heaven right now who fully surrendered himself to Jesus, fully surrendered himself to God, fully believed in the faith of God, had faith in God. So if you don't believe, if I don't believe, does it make the faith of God, does it make a faith of God of none effect? It says, God forbid, let every man be a liar and God be true. The reason why, and this is the reason why, we need to have faith and trust in the faith of Jesus. Why we need to trust in that faith? Not my faith, but the faith of Jesus. The reason why we are to trust only in the faith of Jesus, it is because it is the only faith with an exponential, infinite, rapid growth quality inherent in it. It is the only faith that has this exponential increase continuously because it comes from the infinite being who is Jesus, right? It, is, it has an exponential quality to it. It has this growth quality to it. It is the only faith that is inherently true. We don't have faith inherent. We have it in principle, but inherent as a quality in terms of its exponential reality, it is only in Jesus. Right? And I'll show you how this grows from the Bible. Let's read uh, Psalms, Psalms 84, the 7. It says, they go from strength to strength, exponential growth. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. Now, how do everyone in Zion, Zion, that new Jerusalem, how do they appear before God? How do we appear before God? In the Day of Atonement, remember we're supposed to appear before God? In the Day of Atonement, the high priest goes into the most holy place. He stands there has a represent, as a representative of the people that are outside. He carries them on the breastplate of his of his of the breastplate of the, the, the breastplate of righteousness that he wears the vesture of the different uh tribes that are on his vesture that he carries them into the most holy place that's how we appear before god so how do we appear before god we appear before god we from strength we go from strength to strength exponential strength to strength right we appear before god through our advocate Psalms 80, listen to what Psalms 84, verse 9 says. It says, Behold, O God, our shield. God is our shield. Behold, it says, Be Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thy anointed. God looks into the face of our anointed, the orientation of reality, who is Jesus, who is standing before him. We we represent him. We, 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 we send him forth. He's the forerunner that has gone into the most holy place and says, look upon his face. Don't look upon me. Look upon him. Don't, not me, but him. And when you look upon the face of the anointed, it is the reconciling face of Jesus that brings us back to God. And this is the truth that we need to orient ourselves into. John 1 verse 18, he says, of his fullness, Jesus has this fullness. Of his fullness have we received, have we all received, from grace to grace, from strength to strength, from grace to grace, there's this fullness that Jesus has that he has to give. Remember, it's the fountain of life, right? First Corinthians chapter 3, 
Verse 18, the Bible has this to say. It says, we all, we all, with open faces behold as in the glass the glory of the Father, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The change from glory to glory, from strength to strength, from grace to grace, that is the exponential reality of the faith of Jesus. Those that stand in him are going to go through that. The change that happens to them from glory to glory. By beholding, you become changed. It's a psychological principle. It's a biblical principle that is established that the things that you begin to behold, you're changed into those things, right? So God stake everything in Christ Jesus from eternity. Everything. God put everything in Jesus. They say, oh, don't put your eggs in one basket. Guess what? God had only one basket, and that's Jesus. He put everything in him. Everything in him. Romans chapter 18, verse 25, it says, And now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. This is the gospel that we're preaching today. According to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ. The preaching of Jesus Christ is the gospel. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. So there's a mystery that was kept secret since the world began. And that's the preaching, the covenant. When Jesus covenanted, when the Godhead covenanted and said, he's going to be the sacrifice. He's going, everything has to be put in him. That's the gospel, right? Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11. Listen to what it says. According to the eternal according to the eternal purpose that he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. There's an eternal purpose that God purposed. It's an eternal purpose without beginning, without ending, because these are eternal beings. In 1 Peter, I'm going to read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. It says, For who verily has foreordained before the foundation of the world and was to manifest these in the last, time for you before the foundation of the world jesus was foreordained to manifest this reality for us remember jesus had all the power and the righteousness within him which he could will for himself but he emptied himself so fully that he didn't want to rely upon anything that is in him he could have he could have turned the stones into bread he could have done he could have commanded the angels to rescue. He could have done that. He had all the internal resources. You cannot be tempted to turn, to turn stones into bread. You don't have that power. The devil knows that. Like, he's not foolish. So when he's tempting Jesus and asking him to turn stones into bread, because he knows he has the ability to do it. It's not a temptation if, you, if, if you're going to tempt me with something that I do not have the ability to do it. So Jesus had all this, but he decided, no, I'm totally surrendered to my father. I will live as a man lives. Totally surrender. That is his faith. That should give us courage. That should give us courage to fight because this great warrior, Michael, that has gone before us, the one that stands, has fought and has trodden this path before. All the path that we go through, the realities that we go through on a daily basis, he's been there before. He was tempted in all points that we attempted yet without sin. He is our confidence. He's our profession of our faith. He's our confession of our faith. He is our confession of our faith. So Jesus had all these resources, but he couldn't use them. And let's see that from the Bible. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, verse 27. Matthew chapter 11, verse 27 says, All things have been trusted and delivered to me by my Father. And no one fully knows or accurately understands the Son except the Father, and no one fully knows or accurately understands the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son deliberately will make known him, will make him known unto. Right? So the Son, Jesus as a personality, was never known for a moment here on earth. In seeing him, when you see Jesus as a personality, in seeing him, humanity could only see the Father. It was, it was Christ waking to reveal the Father and not himself. Jesus wasn't here on a self-promotion ministry. No, he came here to review who? I'm going to review the Father. 
And the Father in the Old Testament, he's revealing the Son. And the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he doesn't speak of himself. He speaks everything. He makes manifest of the work of Jesus. That's how the Godhead work. The Godhead do not go on a self-promotion tour. They don't have these, uh, these uh, uh, freak shows that we have for ourselves. Well, we, we promote ourselves. I'm going to promote me and my, my things that I do not know. They, they don't indulge into the Lucifer mentality. Lucifer went on a self-promotion ministry. I am better than the Father. So you guys follow me. And do you see how akin, how our minds are so akin to the devil? Like this is how we think. We like to promote ourselves. We like to promote ourselves. We like to promote our ministers, our pastors, our, our everything. And we don't want to talk about Jesus. You see, Few people will view this video because it doesn't talk about self-promotion. It talks about Jesus. That's how our minds have been sickened by the devil. We're so sick. We're so trauma-bonded with the devil's mind that we think like him. We operate like him. And it has to take God. It really has to take God to begin to orient us to his mind. To see the beauty in the awesomeness of who Jesus Christ is, right? So the sons, Jesus did not come here to promote his personality. He came here to promote the Father. Everything that you see, how Jesus treated people, how he talked, that's the Father. That's the Father. That's the Father. And he's loved so much by the Father because he revealed the Father's character to us. Because the devil's uh, original argument is that there's no self-sacrifice, no self no self-renouncing with the Father. He, he, he cannot, he's full of himself. He cannot, he cannot sacrifice himself. And it took one that knows the Father to come and show us the character of the Father. He says, I'll show you. I'll show you who the Father is. And he came and showed us who the Father is. Right? In John, let's read, read this from the Bible. In John chapter 14, verse 9 to 10, it says, Jesus replied, have I, have I been with all of you for so long a time? And you do not recognize me and not know me yet, Philip? So he's asking Philip. He says, Philip, have I been so long that you do not even know me? Because the question that was asked is, show us the Father. And then he says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Has seen the Father. How can you say then, show us the Father? Verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? You don't believe? I mean, he goes on and says, I, what I'm telling you, I do not say of my own authority. I didn't come here under my own authority. I don't speak as my own authority. He says, my own, or my own accord. But the Father, the Father who liveth continuously in me, who is the daily in me, lives continuously me, does all his works, his miracles, his deeds of power through me. It's the Father. You think this is about me? I'm representing the Father. So whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Because the Father is the daily. Remember the daily in the Old Testament? And people argue about the daily and how the devil comes in and, 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 the, and the, the papacy system takes away the daily. It says, the Father who lives continuously in me. He is the daily. He was the daily for Jesus. He was, the, the Father was the true foundation of his daily bread. So Jesus, you see, Jesus lived by the Father. Let's read more evidence from the Bible. Jesus lived by the Father. And this was his faith. We're talking about the faith of Jesus. Right? And this is the only faith that saves us into heaven. Nothing else will get us there apart from the faith of Jesus. Hence, you need to have an intellectual understanding, a spiritual understanding, an emotional understanding, a living experience of the faith of Jesus. You need to live it. You need to talk it. You need to preach it. You need to show it to others. You need to experience the faith of Jesus. Right? Listen, in John chapter 6, verse 57, it says, As, as the Father liveth, as it says, just as the as the living Father has sent me, I live by through all because of the Father. Even so, whosoever continues to feed on me, 
We're feeding on Jesus right now. Whosoever continues to feed on me, whosoever takes me for his food to nourish, to be nourished by me, in turn, liveth through and because of me. Who is your daily food? Oh, I drink, I eat all. But do you eat Jesus? We are so akin to feed the flesh and not to feed the spiritual aspects by feeding on Jesus. How many times do you really spend time on Jesus? Just to feed on him. Just like you eat your food to sit down and you eat. You take in the nutrition to be nourished by him. You see, we are human beings that need to be nourished. Our souls need to be nourished. The things we watch nourish us. So if I spend time watching everything else that's destructive, it's nourishing me. And you wonder why the flesh is so strong? Why I do not have any resistance to the things of the world? <laughs> it's because of what I've been feeding on. We spend time watching whatever we need to watch and ze zero time with Jesus to feed on him. We don't feed on him. We feed on everything else. We can spend hours on TikTok scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And we choose that by our own will. We banish ourselves from the life of God. We become aliens and strangers to God. How many times do you feed on Jesus? Like really ask yourself that question. How many times do you feed on him? Even the capacity to feed on him. You know, like you've lost the, the, the flavor of Jesus in your life. Like you got zooch, zero, nothing, nothing. You wonder why your character is the way it is? You wonder why you're so warped the way you are? You wonder why you're the devil's pawn now? It's because you don't feed on Jesus. You don't feed on him. And because you don't feed on him, you do not spiritually. We do everything. We go to the gym. We do all these. We exercise. We keep our bodies in. But we do not feed on the only food that matters, and that's Jesus. We're not nourished by him, hence we're not living through him or because of him. We're living because of our own will. We'll be twice dead, right? We are living zombies, waiting for the final destruction. Living zombies, like literally twice dead. You'll be resurrected in the second resurrection, not the first one, but the second resurrection of those that resurrect that have died outside of Jesus that have not oriented their lives in Jesus. This is key to understand. People are going to die eternally. Resurrect the second resurrection only to be killed again. Twice dead, zombies. Because we don't live in Jesus. We, we do not agonize with Jesus. We do not strive to enter in through the gate. We don't. We just live. Hey, I'm going to just live my life without Jesus. Really? You're that self? You're that good? You can live like the devil? Let's see how that goes. What I'm telling you is true. Oh, no, Mike, I know this. Look, when I stand to speak the word of God, I speak as an oracle of God. I repeat that. I speak as an oracle of God. Whether you, what you're listening to me is either inspired by God or inspired by the devil. And if it's inspired by God, you need to listen. If you do not listen and follow through and fall on your knees and say, God, help me, help me, help me. God, help me. I am lost. God, help me. I am lost. Agonize with him until you press your petition to the throne, until he answers you and says, listen, I've got you. But we don't do that anymore. We just live our lives the way we live. Yeah, I'm going to just live my life. I'm, I'm going to be okay. A little bit of prayer here. A little bit of listening to the music here. A little bit of uh, listening to a sermon here. Then I'm fine. The rest of the time we live like demons. The, re the rest of the week we live like demons. We are among us people. Our environments are so corrupted. So toxic. That the, 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 the people we are so foul in their mouths and all these and stinks from hell. Everybody else is in a basket going to hell. And we're there. Comfortable going to hell. You do not need to be comfortable down here. You need to be disturbed by the Holy Spirit. No, but you see, I'm being blessed by God. You know, he's blessing me financially. I have all this stability around me and all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're being blessed. But listen. God pours the rain on both the just and the unjust. He pours the rain on both witches, wizards, and the righteous people. God has got a tendency of blessing you. He can even bless you in your unrighteousness. 
right? And the devil can give you those things and so that he keeps you from finding God. So it's either you're receiving those blessings as a righteous person or you're receiving them as an unrighteous person. God has got a tendency of pouring it on the righteous and the unrighteous. That's who he is. Just because you're receiving all these blessings doesn't mean you're a child of God. Examine yourself, the Bible says. Check yourself before you wreck yourself because you will wreck yourself if you do not examine yourself against the great mirror who is Jesus. Okay, a few people watch this. <laughs> Let's go on. Let's go on. Let's go on. So Jesus, I'm going to read again from this Hour of Ages. Gain the victory through the submission and faith in the Father. Submit. That, 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 that ugly word that people don't want to hear anymore. I can't submit. Eh, I'm an independent Eve. I can do my own things. I can be muscular and do all these other stuff. That submission. See, you see, you think it's about you. No. Submission is not about you. You think, oh, this war is about submitting whether women are gonna submit themselves to their men and no, it's about it's not it's gonna it's gonna it, there's a the if God was to open the veil and show you the ketan or the blinders to just open the blinders and to show you what's really going on in the world, whatever is going on at, in 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 our lives, there's something going on at the at the at the higher level. It's the devil trying to distort God's original plan of redemption, of submission. Because Jesus, when he came here, listen to what he says, Jesus gained the victory through submission and faith in God. When he submitted himself, did it make him less God? Did he become God junior? No. He is still God. Even when he's in the manger, as a baby in the manger, he is still God. In a manger, angels come from the light, from, from heaven, come down here, from these worlds of lights, they come down here and they bow to that baby. He's not God, Junior, he's still God, but he is submitted to the Father. He decides, I'm not going to use my divinity, I'm going to trust in him. So the perfect picture, ladies, mostly, the perfect picture of submission is Jesus. He submitted, he submitted to the Father. And by the apostle, what does he say? He says, submit yourselves before, therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. James chapter 4, verse 7. He says, we cannot save ourselves from the tempter's power. That's the devil. He has conquered humanity. Humanity has been conquered by the devil. He's been mastered. He's our master. He, he is the one that controls us. And we cannot do that, right? He has conquered the devil. And when we try to stand in our own strength, we shall become a prey in his devices. But, here's the but. Here's the good news. The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run and into it. We run into it and are self there in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 10. Satan trembles and flees before the weakest soul who finds refuge in that mighty name of Jesus. Submit. The just shall live by faith. The Bible says that the just shall live by faith. And Jesus, the only one who is just, live by faith in his Father. The true fulfillment of that verse, the just shall live by faith, was wholly and fully fulfilled by Jesus, who is the only one who is just to live by the faith of the Father. That verse was fully fulfilled in him. We are secondarily supposed to fulfill it, but ultimately it's fulfilled by him who lived by the faith of the Father. In Romans, let's read Romans chapter 14 now. Romans chapter 14, I hope you're not weary of the word of God. Don't be weary of the word of God. Listen now in Romans chapter in Romans chapter chapter 14 verse Romans chapter 14 verse 23 it says and he that doubt doubteth is damned if he eats but he that eateth not of faith for whatsoever is not whatsoever is 
is of faith, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Anything that we do that is outside the faith of Jesus is sin. So Jesus' life was sinless because he lived according to the faith of God. So whatsoever is of faith is sinless. Are you with me? He looked to he looked to he looked for holiness or to holiness and righteousness outside of him. You see that from the Bible. Let's read John. John 17. Jesus was looking for holiness. He didn't say, I am holy. I don't no 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 no. He goes on, he says this in the book of uh, John. John 17, verse 11. And then we read John 17, verse 25. Holiness and righteousness. Where was he looking after? Was he looking for what's inside him? He had it. But he chose to look for it outside of him. Listen, it says in John 17, verse 11, And now I am no longer, I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. I come to thee, and then he says this, Holy Father, keep thou them, keep thy, thy name among us those that you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. Who does he call holy? It's his Father. Holy Father. He attributes holiness to the Father. And in the Old Testament, the Father attributes holiness to Jesus. He says the only, the only one holy of Israel. The only one who is holy in Israel. Right? What, where does Jesus attribute his righteousness? Right? Listen. In John 17, verse 25, it says, O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known thee that you that you have sent me. Holiness, righteousness, he says, Holy Father or righteous Father. Even on the cross, we see him. This is this is the picture that we see of Jesus. Even on the cross, we see him looking to the Father and refusing to trust in his own resources. On Calvary. He refused completely to trust in his own resources. And as we are ending the study, I want you to see this because we are on Calvary now and we're going to end right there. When he's on the cross, Jesus is looking to the Father and he refuses to trust in his own resources. This is Calvary. Let's read from uh, the book of uh, Psalms 22, verse 3 to 4 and 8 and 19. Then we'll go to Psalms 31. Listen to what the Bible says in Psalms 22, verse 3, 2, 4, 8, and 19. It says, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praise of Israel. Our Father, and you're going to see that Psalms 22 is Calvary. It's Jesus on Calvary, right? It says, Thou art holy. He looks to God, he says, You are holy. And you are the one that inhabits the praise of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou did deliver them. Verse 8, it says, He trusted on the Lord that he would, he would deliver him, yet let him deliver him. See that he delighted in him, he delighted in, in the Lord. Verse 19, but, thou, but, thou be not, but be thou not far from me, O God, O my strength, hasten to help me. This is Jesus when he is crying, Eloi, Eloi, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabakatani. He, it's in, in Psalms 22. He says, All my strength, hasten thou to help me. All my strength. He doesn't say, I'm going to call upon my own strength. You see, you're being persecuted. You're being killed uh, on Calvary. You're being crucified on Calvary. It's excruciating, painful. But he decides to trust in the Father, to cry to the Father. You have the resources to just blink and everybody turns into dust. But he decides to hold himself. Psalms 31, verse 1. We're going to read this one, then 3 to 5, then 14. It says, in, thy, in the Lord do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in righteousness, verse 3. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me. For 
thou art my strength. Again, Jesus is crying out. He says, thou art my strength. In thine hand, I have committed my spirit. Remember when he, when he died, he says, into, into your hands have I committed my spirit. That, this is Psalms. This is him. Into thy hand, I've committed my spirit. Thou has redeemed me, O Lord of truth. Verse 14, I have trusted in thee, O Lord. I say, thou art my God. This is Jesus on the cross. Psalm 38 again. Psalm 38, I'm going to read verse 11 to 15. It says, my lovers, my lovers and my friends stand far from my soul. Remember, I wanted to start thinking about it when Jesus is about, is, is going through the crucifixion. The lovers and my friends, the disciples, they stand aloof from my soul, from my pain. And my kingsmen stand far off. Everybody else, when Peter is following him on a distance. Everybody else has scampered and all this. They stand far off. Verse 12, it says, They also that seek after my life lay snares for me, traps for me. They that seek my hurt speak mischievous things. And imagine deceit all day long. Verse 13, it says, And I, as a deaf man, as a man who is deaf, heard them not. And as a dumb man, as a man that is dumb that cannot speak, I open not my mouth. Thus I was as a man that heard not, and in whose mouth there was no reproach. This is Jesus on the cross, guys. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope, Thou wilt hear me, O Lord my God. That is why Isaiah says, as a sheep, as a dam taken to the shears, he was dumb and he opened not his mouth. He's quiet. This is Jesus. Psalms 40. He's trusting in God. It's not like he doesn't have the resources to obliviate and destroy everybody else. He can. He can call 10,000 angels and they can come here and wipe the entire continent. But he's trusting in his God. He says, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. He's God, by the way. He has the resources to do all that. Internal resources. But he, we don't even have the internal resources, but we trust ourselves. We have the corrupt internal resources, but we trust ourselves. Oh, God, help us. Listen, Psalms 40, verse 11. We're going to go to Luke and read Mark after that. It says, be, be, withhold not thine Tender mercies from me, O God. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continuously preserve me. All these verses are messianic. This is Jesus. This is his trust. Right? In Luke 23, verse 35 and 37, it says, And the people stood beholding, and this is Jesus when he's on the cross, beholding. And the rulers also with them derailed him, saying, He served others. Let him serve himself, if he be Christ, the chosen one of God. Verse 37, and saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, serve thyself. Constantly, Jesus was being taunted to serve himself, to rescue himself. You're a king of the Jews, go ahead and save yourself. You serve that as save yourself. You're going to hang there naked and you call yourself a king? Oh God. In Mark, listen to Mark. Mark says this in Mark 15, verse 29 to 34. It says, And they that passed by derailed him again, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! Ha! Thou that destroyeth the temple, yeah? You said you're going to destroy the temple, yeah? And build it, and you're gonna build it in three days. Now you're hanging on the cross, ha! And you're gonna build it in in three days. Save thyself again. Save yourself. Save yourself, and come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him, saying among us themselves with the scribes, he served others. Himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend or descend now from the cross, and we may see and believe. What a perverted generation that wants to see miracles for them to believe. 
It's a perverse people that want to see miracles and not hear the word of God to believe in Jesus. And they that crucified him derailed him again, reviled him. And after all this, Jesus, knowing that all things were crucified, is there. He's dumb. He's hearing everything as a dead man, as a deaf man. He speaks as a dumb man. He doesn't speak. He's just there listening to everything, the insults. The insults that are coming in is dumb. It's like a sheep taken to the slaughter. Quiet, listening to all the insults. And after all this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, what did he do? Listen to John. We're ending the study. We're ending the study now. Listen to John. In John 19, verse 28 to 30, listen to what he says. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, He's accomplished. He's finished the work that the scriptures might be fulfilled. He said this. He said, I first thee. And in verse 19, what did they do? Now, there was a set, there was a set of vessel full of vinegar and they filled the sponge with the vinegar and put the hyssop and put it to his mouth. And put it where? To his mouth. So they got a sponge of vinegar. There was a set of vinegar nearby. And then they put it in his mouth. Verse 30. And I'll explain that. Verse 30. And Jesus therefore had received the vinegar. What did he say? He said it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So that set of vinegar. Do you understand what that is? During the Roman time, the Romans never used to have proper toilets. So they would use sponges. The soldiers would use sponges with vinegar as a toilet paper tissue. So you understand that that sponge was used as toilet paper. It had a stench of shit on it. And that's the sponge that they get and they put on the mouth of our Savior. That his final test when Jesus Christ is dying on the cross, his final test is the shit that comes from us. They wipe their asses to be blunt. They wipe their asses with that sponge and mix it in vinegar, then put it on his face. What an insult. What an insult to an eternal God. That's what human beings do. That's what you and me do. We are the soldiers. We are the soldiers that are standing there and crucifying Jesus. Listen to this quotation. It says, Amid is the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God. Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, he had relied upon the evidence of his father's acceptance before, herefore, given to him. He had faith in the father. He was acquainted with the character of his father. He understood his justice, his mercy, and his great love. By faith, he rested in him who it was ever, it has ever been his joy to obey. And as in the submission, he committed himself to God, the sense of the loss of the father's favor was withdrawn. In submission. He committed himself to God. And that sense that he had that the father's favor was lost was withdrawn. By faith, it says, Jesus was victor. By faith in his father, Jesus was victor. Victor. Hope did not present him that he's going to resurrect on the third day. There was no hope. So in 1 John, it says this. In 1 John chapter 5, Verse 4, it says, Whatsoever is born of God, and we know that Jesus Christ was born of God, overcomes the world. 
There's only one being that has overcome the world. He says, I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer when you're down here. Be of good cheer. Because these are broken places. These are places where I have passed and I have overcome. Be of good cheer. Be happy knowing that I have overcome the world. He says, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Our faith, our profession, the one that has overcome the world is Jesus. This is him. He is our faith. The faith of Jesus has justified us. Him having faith in the Father, him fighting through, him setting his mind as a flint, going through, him trusting in his Father, him remaining on the cross, the faith of Jesus has justified us. In Isaiah, in Isaiah 40, 48, Isaiah 50, verse 8, he says, he is near that justifies me. Who has con who can who will contend with me? Let him stand. Let us stand together. Who is my my adversary, my enemy? Let him come near to me. We are the enemies of God. While we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. He says, "Come to me. Come near to me, because I am about to destroy this world." You need to come near to me. You need to hide in me. Isaiah 45, verse 22. These are the last verses I'm going to read. The last five verses I'm going to read. I keep saying the last verses, but these are the last verses. Please bear with me. In Isaiah 45, verse 22, it says, Look unto me and be served. All the ends of the earth, everybody. For I am God and there is none. I swear by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That that unto me every knee shall bow. Unto me every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall swear. There's a time when even the devil shall bow and say, Hey, you are God. We deserve to be destroyed. You better be bowing now. You better be scraping the ground now. You better be giving your life to God now. Because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You do not have control over tomorrow. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? You better be giving your life to God now. Because there's a time when every knee shall bow. Everyone shall confess, including the arch deceiver, the devil. He says, you're God. We deserve to be destroyed. You're God. You better do it now. Surely, one shall say in the Lord. Surely, one shall say in the Lord. In who? In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even in him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. The last verse, 25, it says, In the Lord, in who? In the Lord, shall all the seed of Israel be justified in glory. In glory. In the Lord. This was the faith of Jesus. And in our part two, we're going to talk about faith in his faith. How do I have faith in his faith? And we're going to go ahead and just develop these studies as we move forward. So thank you for joining me. I hope this has been spiritually enlightening, nourishing as well. And I pray that God will help you on your personal journey with him.